This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. This is Scott Wells for the TheMagicWordPodcast.com. Well, today is a very special episode. We are recording our 666th episode of the Magic Word Podcast. And with that, I felt like we really needed to have someone who is extra special, kind of on the spooky side. And I think there is no one better, perhaps, than one who actually leads the seance at the Magic Castle, plus has done a lot of other things, including like The Other Side, which is a great uh, YouTube video series. We'll, We'll get into all that. Plus, even is a member of a band, used to be in a band, but still with another one called The Unholy Three. This is great. I'm, I've really been looking forward to this for a long time. I'm so glad uh, we can uh, welcome him to the Magic Word. Please welcome Rob Zabrecki. Hey there, Rob. Hi, Scott. How are you? Thanks for I'm fantastic, nice especially now that I'm here to get a chance to uh, chat with you. So I had uh, uh, mentioned about the Unholy Three, by the way. That was kind of an offshoot because I know, the, I, without going back into all of your, your history, I know of you doing music beforehand and having different groups and then kind of migrated into magic and but you've always still can maintain that interest in uh, in punk rock mainly i guess or what kind of genre uh all genres i'd say rock rock uh has been the probably the main blanket way to 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 express my my love for for music especially what i've put into magic and and some avant-garde and experimental music has played a key role in helping shape some of my routines and you know using his um background and sometimes even silent pieces i i like to do to music that's it's probably not uh super popular you mean kind of like i guess the early david byrne uh stuff um i guess when he was with the talking heads and they were i thought pretty avant-garde for the time uh, devo and others like that mm-hmm. yeah those are good examples um because those people, they were so unique in what they were doing. They had a very singular vision and they, they drew from things not everybody was drawing from. So it, it kind of put them in their own, uh, in their own place. So, although I wouldn't say I'm a direct line to, you know, maybe Devo or the talking heads, I, I like the more the philosophy that they used uh, in, a, in a kind of do it yourself, more of a punk ethos than, than anything, you know, thinking for yourself and just not worrying about whether someone's going to so much like it or not, but just, um, following your vision. Right. I, I think there is an interesting overlap with music as being as art, uh, as well as performing art, because you're not just performing on stage with music, but you haven't, particularly when you have an audience, so you're doing a live show. Uh, there is a performance art along with that. Um, I mean, it, of course, when you're recording, you're getting into the music, I'm sure. Uh, but um, uh, is there, is there, I mean, am I, am I right? Do I understand what I'm talking about? Does that make sense? Well, yeah. I mean, re- if you're recording music, it's it's an audio experience. Uh, you know, you're you're conjuring up images in your mind of what right. the music looks like. In, you know, and that's going to be different for everybody. Or you see a music video, and you can sort of get an idea of what the band looks like or something. But in magic, it's it's so much there. It's much more because it's, it is it's it is visual, but there's also an audio aspect to it. And, mm-hmm. and uh, so there's there's many different forms at, at play. And I think magic is best performed in person. So that that even puts it in a in on the on the stage, right? Being there among other people and having this more ephemeral experience as opposed to just putting on a set of headphones, listening to your favorite, you know, um, Rolling Stones record or whatever. No, well, that's a good point. Uh, and and what do you draw on as far as your your muse, if you will? Uh, that depends. Every every project, every idea comes from somewhere different. Um, I don't. There's not one well, I would say. It's, it mm-hmm. depends on what, it kind of boils down to wants and needs, you know. Um, a bunch of years ago, I wanted a, a piece of my act about regret. Uh, I just kind of thought this, I was working through something. I thought, well, this would be a nice gap in my, in my this will really fill something personally and it'll, it'll help shape uh, my, my sort of longer hour, Zabrecki hour show. So I found things that would make sense uh, to perform for an audience that, that were, that had a theme of regret 
And then I married it to a magic trick and then I put some music to it and I ended up shaping this whole little experience that, that satisfied me artistically and was also something that it turned out people liked to watch and, and thought was funny. And, you know, there's, there's plenty of, um, uh, there was plenty of ways to sort of mask the, the real, the real feelings of regret with, with more of an artistic, you know, uh, more of a dreamlike way to, to, to get into that world. Do you kind of feel also it's important to let the audience into your world and know you as opposed to look at the pretty thing kind of a thing? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's the whole point of it is that you've, you're, there's a point of view, whether it's my point of view or, or a character that I dreamed up's point of view, that's, that, that, those lines are a little bit blurry. But yeah, I think that's why I was drawn to, to magic was because it, it was a form of self-expression. Well, as music is as well. I would think. Yes. Yeah. Um, and in, in creating some of those things, uh, I'm sure it just takes a long time to kind of work it out. And it's nice that you would have the Magic Castle as a venue where you can go and work out some things from time to time. Is, is that true? Is that where you kind of get to work things or where do you actually go? Oh, definitely. I mean, without the Magic Castle, I wouldn't have had, uh, I, there's, it, it's impossible to, 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 to went where I went without, having uh, that great place to go to every Friday to, to, to head down to the basement and try out, you know, whatever idea that I thought was interesting enough to, to try out and put forth in front of an audience and fail for, you know, a couple of years before it actually clicked and it, it worked into some kind of a, you know, viable routine that I liked and the audiences were responding to. So I think I was really fortunate. Uh, most magicians, of course, don't, don't have that. Most musicians don't have a place where they can go and play every Friday night. I mean, some do, but generally speaking, you know, you, you ramp up towards a gig and then you do that gig and you figure out your notes afterwards. And then you, you do the next one a week, a month, six months later. So the progress is generally slow. Uh, I, you know, that, that's, that's been my experience, but for, in my case, going up to the castle every Friday was, was a mate, was an amazing opportunity uh, to, to, you know, present magic in the best way possible because people are dressed up, that you're in this Victorian house. It's like, it's hard to, uh, to top that as far, in magic at least, for um, an environment to... And people come there to see magic as opposed to going up to their table at a restaurant, would you, hey, pick a card, kind of a thing you're imposing. Whereas here at the castle, people will come to see you and to see magic. They, they, they come knowing what to expect, I guess, if you will. Precisely, yep. Mm -hmm. um, when do you feel as if that you have it down and or else you're going to toss it out when you're working on material? I think this is a key question here. I'm thinking about David Copperfield, for example, in his alien. He'd been working on that for a while. It didn't work if, in his opinion. And the audience kept anyhow, he still has it in his act. But for a long time, it, he just had to keep massaging that. But he knew there was something there. And I wonder how many times you might be discouraged when you were working on something and you think, okay, I know there's something there. The audience is, I think it's the audience, not me. Let me try it again next week with a, a different audience, same routine. Well, that's not working. Let me tweak this or that because I have a belief in this piece that it would work. Uh, at, at what point, if any, do you have material in which you say, this isn't going to, to work. I need to either toss it. I can't, I've adjusted it all I can. And I think it just isn't going to work. Uh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> excuse me. I think that the answer is different for each each routine. I, I I failed and continue to fail so much in, in magic that I have a, a name for my failures. I call them art tears, hmm. um, and they're they're not the tears you cry when you you know lose a pet or a loved one or or something like that or your car gets you know <laughs> stolen. Um, it's the kind of tears that when you've worked on a, a center tear a center tear for three months and it's just not hitting. Whether it's it's your handling, whether it's the, the, the moment that you're looking up and doing the move, it's just off by, you know, a couple minutes where everybody's catching you and you're getting caught or the script's off or whatever that, you know, it can be a million different things that you just have to let go and cut your losses and move on and add up what you've learned from that before you do. So you go, well, okay, I, I, um, I'm going to take, I'm, I'm not going to do this. You know, I, this is my idea for, you know, let's call it the alien or whatever. And I put it in and I'm working on it. And it's just not happening. It's not hitting and you're brainstorming. And in my case, I get feedback from friends and colleagues saying, well, wh you know, what's, what's good about this and what's not good about it? Why isn't it connecting? Because I'm not seeing it. I, don't, I, I think very few 
uh, magicians can can see it. You need someone to to you need guidance. You need you need, you need trusted friends and, and colleagues who are going to say, look, this isn't working for you, and here's and here's why, right? Because we can't. We're in our bodies. We're in our minds. We're we're seeing through this very specific right. lens of like, well, it looks good to me. I don't know. I don't get what's going on. I think this story is fine. I think these it ma- it matches with with this magic effect. I don't get it. So at the point where you you know let go of it that's that's it's the send off it's the art tears and you and you, i think i found a way to find happiness in that now going well hey i i i got to work with say brian gillis on on this amazing move and i got mm-hmm. to see how he did it and i got to study six different methods of this and i can't maybe it's not going to work for me now but i got to learn some magic principles and through it it was a it was a valuable experience um and i think you know as magicians we fail a lot it's it's you, you know you see what's on st- we all see the end result of what's on stage for i don't know now it's more of we see it more of a in, in see plenty of, of videos uh, of people's performances on you know penn and teller or you know fool us or, or they're they're you know their performance the magic castle or whatever they're doing so we kind of see the polished and end all be all end all result uh what we don't see are the you know many sometimes hundreds sometimes thousands of hours of of you know artist development and back behind the scenes stuff stuff that didn't work. So, you know, I think it's it's important to know that um you're gonna fail. You're you're gonna I'm gonna continue to fail. There's things that I'm working on right now that are probably not gonna work out in the future. But uh but it's a it's it's all about the ride. I think it's about, you know, the, the journey and in loving what I do. I, you know, I, I don't mind I don't mind if something doesn't work out, I go, that's okay. Like it's I'm I'm fine with it. I think failure is part of success. You're not going to be successful unless you have had a few failures. Everything can't, everything can't work out perfectly all the time, certainly. And so I think it's important to, to learn from those mistakes and to uh, certainly grow and, and, and to move on. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and have fun with the fail. I mean, and, and to like, I think to, uh, to address failure is, is, is something that's, it's part of the joy of it. Like you just have to, you have to know that's going to be a part of it. And I think, People get frustrated, and you know, they, or or they don't take a. If people that aren't aren't good listeners, that don't want to accept, you know, opinions that from you know again, and I say trusted friends and colleagues and close ones, you can't just you know anyone's gonna have an idea about what your magic act should be, and and oftentimes they do give you those opinions, but you have to narrow the focus of who you're going to listen to and and really define that, and then once you do that, when those people are offering information you've got to listen and you've got to be able to go okay i'm stubborn and i think this is i think that maybe i they might be wrong but they might be right and i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna exhaust this idea until you know i see it through a different lens so anyway yeah, I, I think you have to have that uh that persistence and also i think you had another key point there of getting that outside viewpoint a lot of times we are just seeing ourselves and thinking nope you know that this is good i believe in it and someone else is saying they might help you adjust it, but before long saying, nope, this just isn't going to work or it's not your character. And so, yeah, having some, a few trusted friends who can, can help out. I think that's uh, important to just to tell you when to stop also, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I, and maybe, maybe it's not a friend. Maybe it's somebody who's not, who's just going to, who's not going to try to find a, a, a warm and fuzzy way to say, that's terrible. Take it out. But you hire a director and they, they, have, they don't have a horse in the race in that way. So they're going to say, look, this isn't working. Good point. Here's why. So, I think, you know, there's a, you got to have a thick skin for this stuff because, you know, we can all lay in our beds at night and dream about how great something's going to be. And it's <laughs> it, it this fantasy version of how amazing it's all going to be from beginning to end, this flawless piece of art. Um, but getting there is uh, obviously. As we now, as we one said. important thing I have learned from so many people over the years and the different episodes of the podcast, and that is of developing a character, because once you have a character, as you do, then you can write for that character more easily. This is how this person would react in this situation. And so that way, whenever you are developing a routine for an act, you can plug and play and it stays the same character as opposed to doing something. And all of a sudden, like in your case, you start doing something wacky and crazy that is outside of your character. Although it's a great routine, it's just not you. So um, do you find there are new things you're working on for your character that are easy to put in? Or do you reject some things saying, man, that's great, but it's just not me? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the more... You, the further you are down the road of of having a, a 
fully formed you know character or persona uh you, you know right away it's just you you know the taste you know the feel you know the vibe of what that what's going to fit in that world and what's not so it's very easy to make those decisions early on not so much i mean you, you, that's what the whole i think discovering that uh is is a fun uh journey in its own so and, and you get to a point where where once it's defined you can you i think you save a lot of time and you just you just know it you just, it just becomes innate i'm curious about how you actually found your character for an example in talking with jeff hobson about how when he was doing this this gay type of character he was in a like a biker bar a club one night or he had said some funny line and responding to being gay or something and he was just getting a lot of good response and one thing kind of led to another was there a an epiphany moment or was it something that was hard for you to try to work on to get to this character there there I, there was a there was an epiphany i would say when i was very early on uh late 90s i'm at the magic castle i'm trying to figure out how to be a magician and revamp myself in magic and i'm not taking to it well scott it wasn't like it was like i just strolled in and was able to you know <laughs> flawlessly do this stuff it was i was terrible and there are people alive to say yeah he was terrible he, he was really 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 bad and he should have he should have bailed out when he had the chance um but i was trying and i was really trying to figure out whether it was card tricks or close-up magic or stage magic or parlor or was it comedy or was it straight up mentalism i was like just trying i was like i wanted it so bad i was trying everything and nothing was really working and then there was a time uh, when I was living in Silver Lake with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And I was kind of like, you know, dancing around the house on a Sunday afternoon in my underwear and I'm goofing around and I was got, doing God knows what. And, and she, she, she stopped me. She's like, that's it. It's that. If you can perform magic through that lens, it'd be really funny and interesting. And I kind of looked at her and then it, it all kind of made sense, not realizing it was going to have the life that it did, but going, oh, yeah, that's uh, why not try this? And so then the next Friday, I went to the Magic Castle and it was very, you know, something that was very kind of a little more stoic, a little the, the pauses were bigger than surprising things would happen in the, a wild dance at the end of the show. Right. To, contra to contrast all that stillness. Um, and then suddenly the three tricks that I, would, that I was doing with under that you know the guise of that the, the parameters of what i just described uh it worked and audiences were compelled and they were laughing and they they, they were they they wanted to go on that that ride with me so that was yeah. the beginning of it and from there it was just like just refining this you know this this sort of um idea of what a character what that character could, could be now Moving then on to, into uh, like the seances and things like that, did you start working at the seance room there at the castle first, or did you start doing some of the YouTube seances earlier? Uh, well, I started doing the the seance of the Magic Castle first. Okay. Uh, about, about 10 or 12 years ago now, uh, I, I started filling in for Leo Casca, who, who's been uh, performing them since, you know, I think the early 83, I think 1983. And uh, so I'd fill in for Leo and, you know, one seance led to, I don't know, 250 or something like that. I've performed an awful lot of them. So those were, you know, something that I was interested in, spirit magic, spirit theater, um, you, the early works of, you know, Eugene Berger and Tony Andruzzi and people like that. Uh, really fascinated with the world of, of, of um, spiritualism and seances. And I just was really taken, taken by that, uh, that idea of, of spirit magic so that developed over time i was i started doing more and more of them and then at the same time i thought you know i've been performing this magic character for 15 years and it's i was always under the, with the idea of this is meant to be on stage it's meant to be for a live audience what would it look like if we put it on you know on television or you know mm -hmm. if we taped it and it was on whether it be youtube or you know hulu it, it just we wanted to see what it looked like in in this in this box right so that, that led, exactly so that led to the other side with with Zabrecki indirectly but it got us there and so we decided to have a seance show where i could invite guests in my house and they could contact a spirit of their choice and we could sort of put filters on what Zabrecki world would look like to to an audience which was really fun because 
uh, we did it ourselves. So we got to, you know, I produced, and I say we, it was my wife and I, we created and basically did it together. Uh, and so got to write, produce, direct, act, you know. And, and you put the whole thing together, you edit, you do the post and everything as well and music and. We had a friend come in, help us, who was a very talented uh, uh, editor, and he was able to kind of help. Like, I, I would describe something, and he would say, what about this? And he would pull up examples, and we would, so we kind of started doing these collages um, and, and started that process. And then we built, basically built a model for the first episode, which was uh, with Jason Sudeikis, who, who came over and we contacted the spirit of Pistol Pete Maravich, the basketball legend. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, so we created this sort of model of like what the title credits look like and how that how we would move from one thing to the other, and holding hands and drifting off to the afterlife and then actually talking to this spirit that you want to talk to. So by creating this model, <clears throat> we're able to kind of copy that and use that uh, or use that for a style guide for, for the rest of the episodes. And what is I, I keep forgetting, what's the word when you, you have that? It's not mucus, but the, the white stuff that seems like it's coming out of your nose and everything. What's that called? ectoplasm ectoplasm thank you <laughs> just yeah. slipped my mind over there it, those kinds of things yeah the the production i think is great now and the friends also jason sudeikis and jack black and uh, some of the other uh, people who are musician artists I, are they all friends of yours or someone that you had contacted or certainly yeah i mean i i i'm from la and and have and had uh, as you as we mentioned i had a previous life in, in music so i've kind of <clears throat> I, I knew jack through music i met him in, in the late 80s we were in our like we were 21 i think was that back when he still had his group he hadn't had his group yet he was he was a ucla student oh wow and, uh, was like a college dj and just kind of hanging around some of yeah. the same art circles and things like that music worlds so i had i was familiar with you know jack and some of the others through through um my career as a musician and then some of them through uh through through my life in magic so when it came down to doing it we realized let's ha- let's get some really fun kind of showbiz friends to come on who people would recognize and it would you know widen the net a little bit for the audience but they're all people that we really liked and respected and wanted to you know see who they would contact and it was a really fun collaborative process to to make those things so I would say it was a combination of people that I knew through through music and and magic. You were putting those out about once a month or so for a while. Uh, it's been about a year, I guess, since you've last put one out or how? how yeah, we wrapped, we, we wrapped it up. I mean, I think that the, I think we wanted to do a season where there was, you know, 13 seemed the, the, mm-hmm. the obvious right. you know, choice to, to, to stop the, the, uh, the season. And we talked about doing the second season. There were for what they are for the, for the seven or eight minute videos that they are, they're a lot of work. Uh, and it was very time. I can tell very labor intensive. Um, so I think we decided to kind of let, let go of, of the idea of doing it um, because, again, it was everyone's working for free and just, it was a labor of love. And although they were really fun and we could have done a second season and made some changes and maybe made it, you know, tweak different things here and there. I'm, I'm kind of I'm proud of it. I'm happy that we did it. They were great. And the goal was to make again to, to create this to take the character out of the, you know, the, the stages of, you know, magic festivals and conventions of the magic castle and see what it looked like on on camera and we did it so uh, you know kind of like it was like mission complete very happy to look back on those and i chuckle every time uh you know i i, I look at them and i'm proud of them in that we got to we, we we really covered all aspects of there was no outside um person saying this is the this is going to be your walk you know this is this is we, we created everything and that was a, and that was something that I'm, I'm really happy about because in, look, you, you don't have a lot of control. If you're an actor in a film, you don't choose the movie credits. You don't choose the music behind you. You don't choose the other actors you're working with. If you, if you work on a, I don't know, a magic festival or convention, you don't, you're not picking the MC that for that night. You're not picking the right. color of the, the curtain, but when you shoot a seance in your living room, you can, all those ideas are all yours for better or for worse. And um, I think, it makes me really happy to know that like we were able to accomplish that. Yeah. And doing it in black and white, of course, was, was perfect then as well. Did you have enough views that you could actually monetize that on YouTube? God, no. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I'll tell you, we, we knew going into it, it was going to be a jo- almost a, a joke for ourselves and, and for our friends because 
it, it was so non-commercial, the music <clears throat> that we chose, none of it, <clears throat> none of it <clears throat> had, say, commercial appeal. Some of the guests are, you know, commercially known, but it was always strictly for ourselves, knowing that it was going to be a very sort of niche thing. And believe me, I had agents and managers saying, you can get Jack Black on your show and this is the show you're making? <laughs> yeah. So it, was, it was kind of a, a funny in that way that, that it was so you know, as, as non-commercials and end up being. One of the things also about that, of course, you're dealing in the spiritualism. Uh, and I was, um, uh, I've been talking with some different people about spiritualism who that uh, apparently that is not just was a religion, but still is. And, uh, um, talking to Doc Hilford, for an example, Doc has said, yeah, that there are spiritualist churches and places where people can go. Have you gone or I mean, how much in-depth research have you done, I guess, on spiritualism? As much as I can. I mean, it's, I'm fascinated by it. And yeah. <clears throat> it's an ongoing thing. You've become almost a, like a, a you know, student of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there, I, I visited a, a spiritualist church in, in, uh, in Lancaster, California, about an hour from here. It was amazing. Uh, there's a what was that like? Completely far out. It was amazing. I loved it. I had a great experience. Uh, Did it seem like it was a show almost or something? Or they have a preacher or they sing? I, mean, I only know yeah. regular church all, services. All, all of the above. Yeah. Wow. It was, it was, uh, it was a you know, house of belief. There's, a, there's a, um, a spiritualist community on the East Coast called Lilydale. Uh, yes. And, and it's just, you know, you, yeah, I'm sure a lot of the viewers and listeners will know about Lilydale. Those of you that don't, it's a community, um, I forget what's, is it Maine? It's, it's somewhere up there in the north, northeast. I thought it was in Florida. Is it in Maine? No, it's, yeah, I believe Definitely it's- Definitely northeast. Northeast. And, okay. um, and so this is a community of, of, you know, spiritualists and gypsies and people of that nature who mm -hmm. you can walk on the grounds and go see a number of people in contact, you know, uh, grandpa or or your or maybe a pet i don't know you decide and, and you've been there too you've been there no i haven't but there's a there's a wonderful documentary about it called no one ever dies at lilydale that i've uh, i've watched and uh, there's a book there's a um it came out in the late 70s early 80s a hard hard hardcover book uh on on lilydale so and they recreated the the the, the fox sisters house there which burned down which was in upstate new york um it it burned down after they left and then they recreate, I think, I believe they recreated it to scale uh, on, on Lily, Lily wow. property. So it's kind of the hub. If you, if you want to, you know, dive into that world, I think that's a great uh, documentary to see. Was that on Netflix or what was that? Uh... I, don't, I don't remember what it's on. I'm not sure. It, it's out there though. What's um, it called again? No one ever dies at Lilydale. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. But there's so much, I mean, there's so much great information, uh, just on the internet about about spiritualism and, and you know it's what, just that today i a lot of people think of that as being an, an old thing and like houdini's time when he was busting spiritualists and everything because after world war ii or world war one people were wanting to contact their their lost husband or son or whatever and started getting into all that and they were taking people's money so it seemed like it was a wave i guess and that had died out and that's what i want to kind of bring up i guess is the fact that not completely hasn't died out there are still believers and churches and, and all this uh certainly not to the extent i guess uh, popularity or notoriety of what that it was back in the 20s let's say but uh still around oh yeah it's still around i mean i think people want to believe sure yeah in the 20s it was a it was a fad you know it was a craze like like so they, they came and went primarily in America and, and England. That this, these are the two countries that it, it, it was very popular in. But it, it, you know, whether Houdini stood on stage and said, look, this is what these people are doing. These are the, this is, here's the flap of the spirit slate. Here is mm -hmm. the medium's grip. Here's how this stuff works. Here's a, here's a spirit rod. We're going to tap somebody, over, you know, exposing these people one after the other. Marjorie, right? The Witch right. of Lime Street. Uh, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. This, you know, he did everything he could to say this stuff is fake, but yet people want to believe, and they still do. And that's that's that, I doubt that's ever going to change. No, I I agree, and I want to talk about seances, about people believing when you do this at the Magic Castle. But I was thinking about to say also, I believe it was Marjorie. 
one of the theories I'd heard of the person who had punched Houdini was set up by Marjorie or some of the spiritualists who were wanting to take him out, I guess, basically. That was just a theory I'd heard about why he was killed. I never heard that. And when I, from what I learned about the guy, um, his last name was Godhead. He was a friend of this writer for a college paper and he, he showed up uh, to, he was, he was tagging along basically while his buddy was writing an article for uh, a Canadian uh, college newspaper. Mm -hmm. And so he was extended, I think he was a little bit off this, this fella. And he said, um, he just asked the, he asked him the one question, is it true you can take a blood of the stomach? Houdini said, yes. And then on the offbeat, he, you know, there was this punch, he threw a punch there, right. which was, Right. Kind of, and I, I, and then after his, his, um, after Dean's passing, that the, the the guy, the 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 man went was very reclusive. He never talked about it. And I think he was. Uh, I, I don't think he was. He was put up. You don't by, think he was set up? I, I mean, I don't know. It makes for, for a good sure. story. It makes for a good story. But I, out of respect to what I've learned about him, I would say he probably uh, would not have taken the bait from somebody was going to offer him a hundred dollars to, to do that. I right. mean, it's, I don't know. I wasn't there. I think his name, that does ring a bell, Whitehead or something like that. Whitehead. Yeah. Yes. It's been a while since I've kind yeah. of looked him up, but yeah. Um, and, and then going back to the seance, uh, particularly at the castle, because people come to seances with their own belief system. I did seances uh, with Jamie Salinas here in Houston for eight years uh, during the month of October, each weekend. And people, would come in with their own beliefs, whether they believed in wanting to talk with someone on the other side. Some people were skeptics and some people were just there for a good time. Um, and so we had decided early on, not necessarily to try to be a person who, through whom the, the dead can speak, but we were just gonna be basically ghost hunters, if you will, as well. We, we were just as interested to find out whether something is out there or not. We'll just give it a try and see. So how have you developed your character to are you a medium or how do you or, or a ghost hunter or exactly what is your character well in the sudini seance room i'm a spirit medium and it's and and i straight up say tonight's seance will be similar to one that you might have seen between the years you know 1875 through 1925 so they they know that i'm i'm guiding them down this this path uh that i'm sort of uh, I, I don't want to say a civil war reenactment but but it, along the lines of that sort of this is what you might have seen in the ilk of <laughs> in the ilk of and i and i and i um i never once say that i'm a believer because i'm i'm not a believer at all uh but i i act as one would as i tell them i i, I play the role that i tell them i'm going to play and i and i repeat the lines if you believe you will receive those are the some of the things you know that was one of the the uh you know mantras slogans whatever that that mediums were saying back in the day yeah we always begin our seance for those who believe uh, no explanation is necessary for those who don't know no explanation will suffice yeah and that's pretty much right yeah yeah the old, that old dunninger quote is so great uh yeah i love that i love that one so good um, and so do you have people afterwards, I assume you do, who will say to you, hey, can, I need to talk to somebody or can you tell me who's going to win the Super Bowl or that kind of thing? I do. <laughs> How do you deal with that? I run. <laughs> I run. <laughs> Try to get down to the ballet and get back to my house and just yeah. forget that it happened. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's astonishing to me. People want to believe so bad sometimes that they, they mm -hmm. just, you know, even though they've just been on this ride that feels like a Disney ride in, in a way, right? Because it's this immersive thing and there, clearly there's voices coming through speakers and there's apparitions that are, you know, performed through like Pepper's Ghost Illusions and things. Right. I think everybody knows that it's not what, what they're, they're in a room that's set up, right? So afterwards for them to sort of put all that aside and say, well, I know that that was fake, but can you come over to my place Bring up Uncle Eddie, you know. Um, it's just I don't I I kind of don't get it because I again I, I'm not I'm not doing seances in my house for fun. I think it's these are they were they were they were comical in, to a degree and they were uh, you know horrible <laughs> to to other degrees. You know, so like this is something that I don't um, I'm fascinated by it, but it's like it's almost like 
like watching a documentary about you know, serial killers or the Manson family or something. You're like, wow, what was this? What were these people thinking? You've seen Nightmare Alley, I assume? Not the new one. No, not yet. I, I, I will. Yeah, uh, yeah, the Guillermo del Toro. Um, you, you did see the old black and white. Was that 1936, I believe? Uh, that's available on YouTube. You can watch the uh, the oh, old yeah. one on there. Oh yeah. Uh, so I watched that first, and then just recently saw the new one, and um, that's one of those things that kind of reminded me when when you were talking about that about the uh, um, the fact of doing the spook show. In other words, he's he's doing mind reading and everything, and then someone comes to him and says, "Can we?" But can you come to my house and uh, let me talk to my wife or whatever? And then things go bad. Uh, mm. So it's, yeah, there are, are people who, who do believe, who do are looking for answers uh, wherever and however they can and trying to find uh, someone to uh, come and, and help them reach out. So I think that that would be fairly difficult. I remember going to the first time I went to the Magic Castle back in 80 was or something like that and francis uh, uh willard was working with glenn falkenstein and they were doing their spirit cabin and then he was doing his uh blindfold act with the metal shield and everything but what i remember most is after it was over and people were leaving the theater that uh glenn went over a stage right over by the stairs there and people were lined up and they were asking him questions uh, about their job i mean just everything and there must have been 10 or 12 people i guess who were lined up i mean not everybody was was waiting and, and he was talking to people i don't remember what advice he i didn't know him or anything at the time i just thought huh that's that's really interesting that he would do that not it something that you do no 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 <laughs> like you say i run <laughs> I run, I run, and then I, if, if I, if I, if I encounter someone later, they're usually surprised that uh, the, the off-character person that they meet is not, you know, the, the person who, who, you know, guided them to the seance or, you know, whatever. Now, the people who have been the mediums, uh, the seance before, uh, I remember Steve Spill's father, um, Sandy Spill, I believe it was, was he the original one? I believe Sandy was the second medium. It was uh, Francis Carlyle and then Sandy Spill. And that led into uh, there were Mark, um, not Mark Walker. Um, boy, his, his last name just gave me uh, 10 great lectures on seances. Uh, Mark, I'll have to look at that again. Um, that led to Leo. And, and then eventually uh, Leo, and Leo brought brought me on. What Leo Binky? Leo who? Uh, Leo Casca. Casca. Leo, yeah, Leo Casca. Mm -hmm. um, it, what's interesting, I think, is how the medium lasts so long. I mean, it, it wasn't just like for a year or so. They kind of, I mean, in the 60-year history, there have only been less than a half dozen. I know. It's it's really interesting. And, and uh, I it's a miracle and amazing. I'm always surprised that I've done them for, you know, coming up on, on 12 years. 12 um, years. Wow. Mm -hmm. and it's not every night. I mean, look, I've, I've, I have many other, you know, there's many other things that I do in life and it's, sure. it's, uh, there's not seances every single night. Uh, they call you in and say, Hey, we got a group tonight or you. Yeah, well, no. So they book them in advance and they're, they're, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of time out to sort of, you know, uh, fix this, you know, adjust schedules and things to make, to make them work. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, let's say a few, there's been a few a week. It's ramping back up since the room reopened. A lot of people mm -hmm. are interested to see this, this new version of, um, excuse me, of the seance room. So there's, it's, it's, and, and, and as people are going out more these days, it's becoming a little bit more, uh, you know, it's more, it's more busy. Did know? things change electronically after the fire uh, some years ago? No. Or did, was that room affected by the fire? Strangely. Uh, the house, the Magic Castle almost caught on fire. The one room that was not affected by any of it, the Houdini Seance Room. Now that is weird. <laughs> it is weird. It's, what's weird is that combined with uh, the theme that year was Inferno. I don't know if you, it's 2011 and each Halloween has a, has a theme. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like this, yeah. Dante's Inferno, I think this year. Exactly. It was, that was, that was Dante's Inferno point. Two hours or something like that. But the, the original one was 2011, and that that year, that was the year that uh, that, it, that it you know caught a blaze and uh, and was down to the house. The house because of the sprinklers. The sprinklers did more damage than the actual fire. Mm. Uh, the fire was primarily on the roof. The some roofers came and they were putting molten goop on there, and a piece 
fell into the attic and it and it started up. Luckily, the fire department got there very quickly. But the but it was the sprinklers that, that damaged <clears throat> um, a lot of the artwork and and uh, you know carpets and sort of sure. wood and things like that and sort of the some of the frame pieces. But I don't ask me don't ask me how don't ask me why. Green Sands Room unscathed. But I will ask you this. Uh, I won't ask you about that, but I will ask you about uh, what weird things have happened over the last 12 years. I mean, in the eight years we were doing, because we only did it on one month out of the year. You do it throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Over a period of time, there has to be some things that are coincidental that are beyond the scope of this just being a coincidence. No. (laughs) Good answer. (laughs) Okay. Nothing out of the ordinary nor supernatural. Fair anyone, enough. anyone can get spooked in the dark and sure if the lights are out and i'm walking out i and uh you know i almost trip on a cord i can i can attribute that to uh to something supernatural but no it's i right. I, I, I haven't had any experiences that have i would close to go on record on saying that i had it yeah I, I just wondered if they had had anyone told you in advance uh who would have been your predecessor or or someone who had come in saying, well, I experienced, I mean, as again, some people come in with certain belief systems that this is really real. And so they want to come back again because, oh, last time I was here, something different happened. Oh whatever. yeah. All the time. And those are the people that, you know, if you believe you will receive, well, they believe and they, so when the lights go out, if you, you can start feeling all kinds of things, people, the lights mm-hmm. come up in the sands and people say, I felt someone tap my shoulder and, and, you know, Sure. I, I think, you know, these, the, if you want that to happen, things like that to happen, they will. Well, yes, exactly. You can also implant those kinds of um, thoughts before they even leave. Like this place we have uh, where we work is uh, there's a creaky old staircase to get up there. And we talk about this prostitute who had died there. Long story, anyhow, that you might feel this icy touch of a, of a person you know, pushing you or tapping on the shoulder. So be careful when you're walking down the steps because, you know, some people have fallen feeling as if someone has pushed them. So uh, be sure and hold a handrail. And then later someone will say, yes, I thought I did feel someone. There was no one behind me because I've implanted that thought, you know? Yeah, of course. That's that, all that stuff. I mean, that's, there's so much, there's so many psychological aspects to that. And sure. once you lose your, your vision and lights go out and you're, you're, you're amped up and you're psychologically prepared to have this, this experience, yeah, things are going to happen. You're looking for something then to happen yeah, too. Of course. Taking this just a, a, a step further, uh, I've never been to the Brookledge Follies. I understand you've performed there several times. Tell me something about that and yeah, where sure. it is, what happens, and some of the people who are there. Of course. Yeah. So the Brookledge Follies um, is a variety show, it's an invite only variety show that takes place in an antique theater about two miles south of the Magic Castle in, in Los Angeles. It's the Larson home, uh, which was originally the, the home of, of Floyd and Jenny Thayer, the, the famous uh, magic manufacturers and creators. So Floyd Thayer had, had bought the house in the late 20s and then built this antique theater in his backyard in the early 30s. And it was the showroom. It was a very large showroom with a big stage and on that stage, they would show, they would perform larger, you know, stage illusions um, and, and magicians would come in and there was a counter and you could buy whatever was coming out, whatever. So it was a magic shop as well. It was a magic shop. Yeah. And this was, huh. and, and people like, uh, you know, you had everybody from Orson Welles, uh, Rita Hayworth going and performing there on the stage. There would be, there would be performances and gatherings. It was the, uh, I would say it was a mecca for ma- magicians in LA before the magic castle. So the Floyd, Floyd and Jenny thought it was haunted and they swapped deeds with the Larsons who lived in Pasadena because the Larsons were in the, in the magic world. Of course, William Larson Sr. was a magic attorney. It uh, was an, an attorney slash magician, magic yeah. attorney. Uh, <laughs> I, there's no such thing as that. Um, well, money in that. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, they, uh, they, they switched deeds and the Larsons moved into the, to the house. So before the magic castle, this was the place that magicians would go. So 1963, the Magic Castle opens and the Larsons still live in this, you know, uh, live in this house, uh, Brookledge, it's called Brookledge, because of, and, and it's, it's in an area of LA called Brookside, where there's a, th- there's a, a, little, a little river that runs through the backyard. There's a, beautiful, uh, <clears throat> there's a beautiful bridge that goes over this 
it's a nice little, it's more of a creek than a river, but it's, mm. it's a very, very beautiful neighborhood and sort of near Hancock Park where all the, a lot of the, the movie stars in LA live. It's a very kind of fancy neighborhood. And so I became friends with Erica Larson 20, 25 years ago and 10, 12 years ago, uh, there was this, there, there was, she's living at Brookledge and we're there and, um, uh, started talking and we said, Hey, let's put on a, let's put on a variety show. Let's invite some of our, our friends and make, do a variety thing. I, get, I had a background in music. And so I thought we could really craft a really fun show. Uh, so we, you know, we brought in, you know, Tina Linder played the harp for some stuff and we had a theremin player come in, our buddy wow. ours, the theremin and people, rock groups, you know, would, would come in and do a stripped down version of just to play a few songs on acoustic guitar and then we have a magician and a juggler and all of all these great uh variety uh, artists basically yeah, yeah and magicians certainly with a with an emphasis on magic there's that's always been you know i think honoring uh the legacy of of you know what what the place was there for you know the, the thayer and the, the larson um you know that all that all that magic had to i, I think there was like there's always the theme was always there's always some two or three performers that would be doing some kind of magic effects. And I, and I would always push for someone to do an old magic trick was blue phantom or something that we might've seen back, back in the day. Because right. You're in this antique theater. It's like, it's a, it's an incredible uh, place to perform magic or anything for that matter. So we did one hundred people showed up. It was magical night. It was fantastic. Boy, let's do another one a few weeks later. The next thing I know, that it, it evolved into what became the Brookwich Follies. And Erica has been an amazing, generous, amazing person. I love her to death. She's like a sister to me. And just made this, she opened up her house uh, once a month for these things to happen. And it's taken its own. Once a month? They do that monthly? Mm -hmm. they, oh, I thought it was an annual thing. So summer, summer months, it summers, months, winters would, would go dark. <clears throat> um, and uh, there's been times where it's been close to renovations and things like that. And, uh, and there's, you know, there's definitely been some, some darker periods, but yeah, in the summer, it's like once a month and the, some of the most fun performers who normally no one gets paid. It's, it's people do this for the love of like, right. it's performers performing for performers. So I kind of lucked into it because uh, you know, just knowing Eric and just kind of pitching this idea early on saying, Hey, what, yeah. let's, 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 let's do something together. So I got to host a lot of those shows and we actually did a, did a spook show 10, 12 years ago there. We did an actual spook show like you might've seen in the 1930s um, where there was an actual blackout lights went out and a, you know, there was a gorilla on the loose and there was a chainsaw and kind of went to this blackout where, you know, apparitions went flying all over the room. And some phosphorescent stuff that was of, glow in the dark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We really tried to do a straight up lo-fi spook show that you would have seen, you know, back in the days sure. of you know, Elwin and, and people like that, mm -hmm. which was such, so much fun. Uh, and, and getting to collaborate with, you know, some of my good friends in magic to make it as, as good as it could have, could have been. And how many people actually uh, attend or are seated in the theater? I mean, like a hundred people or 20? Yeah. Or? So it was a hundred, I think it's like 75 to a hundred. And we did, did maybe two shows a night for two or three, three nights, maybe two nights. So we ended mm -hmm. up doing it four, four times, uh, four, four times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Wow. Well, yeah. I'd, I'd heard about that. I'd never attended one, but it's, I didn't, again, realize it was, it was a monthly thing, you know, during the summertime, but um, yeah. it sounded like that was just a, a whole heck of a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. And the, the, the environment and the setting of going into this, you know, you're in Hancock parks, so a lot of very, you know, large Spanish and, and eclectic architecture and you, you, you you're on a residential street and you walk through this, you know, you walk up a side gate and you kind of wander through this iron gate and all of a sudden this, you, you find yourself wandering into this beautiful garden. It's this beautifully manicured garden that feels- Like Shangri-La. Like Shangri-La. It's just incredible. And there's little staircases that go here and there and there's this, this little, you've got the creek and it's beautifully lit at night. And um, very friend, I've always found very kind of interesting, friendly people and lots of good conversations. People know it's a special thing. So they kind of look at, like the magic castle. You kind of feel like, Hey, I'm at this, I'm at a, I'm, I'm at a very interesting time and place in, in life. And I think everyone celebrates that together. And that's what, that's what gives the fuels, the energy of, of, uh, of those. Shows. Right. 
Man, that sounds so cool. Um, along that line, I was thinking about variety artists. And I was reading where just before Michael Jackson had died, you were invited to perform at a party for his son, Blanket. Uh, and it was just you and a hula hoop artist and a juggler and no invited guests. Was yeah. that weird or is that typical? <laughs> that just sounds weird to me. It was, it was, it would have been weird if you, even if it wasn't, you know, Michael Jackson and his yeah. kids, it was just a very bizarre uh, uh, event, which I, I, I was very close to not performing. It was a Saturday I remember it being a Saturday afternoon and getting a phone call from a producer friend saying, Hey, uh, come, to, come on down, got a gig, 500 bucks, do 10 minutes for a very small, intimate group. And it didn't sound, and I was a, bit, a busy day. It was a, so last minute. I'm like, Yeah, I don't think so. And he told me it was Michael Jackson. And of course, I, I had myself. You said, What time? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was just fascinated with, with his you know, trajectory in, in art and in life and was just like so obsessed with with him had been since since um really when like the, the chimp came in we started getting kind of like trippy uh you know i loved off the wall and some of those early records but in the in early 80s not as interested in like more like late 80s on up, up until um he passed which is such a far out person you know to me character and so had you spent much time with him to get to know him as being that far out character God, no, no, I didn't meet him at all. I mean, I was, oh. I was, I was ushered in, you know, I of course I invited my, my wife with me, we get to the gate and they're like, she, they didn't let her in. Uh, wow. When I got there, I thought it was going to be, there was 50 people outside of his house in Humbly Hills. I thought, oh, this is the party. This is, there's going to be sure. you know, a couple hundred people there. And, and then they immediately said, my wife couldn't come in. That was a red flag. Then they took my phone. That was a red flag. Uh, and then they put me in this like an exercise laundry room with the, with these other performers, and they're like you're you're gonna walk down this little, you're gonna walk down this grassy knoll here, and then you're gonna make a right at the pool, and then there's there's gonna be a little area with with some a few chairs, and that's the party. Okay, so then I had I had like a music cue, so I had somebody down there to kind of get that ready, and I remember people that, that you know when the juggler. And, and the uh, hula hoop artist came back there like, that was really strange. But like, there was no time that we, we weren't conversing. It was just like, that was bizarre. And like, you, Zabrecki, go. So I walked down, I'm going down this thing. And I'm like, okay, it looks like there's just a few. Oh, interesting. Not a lot of people. Okay, where's the party? And then in the pool, which was in a state of disrepair. This is some massive mansion in, in, uh, in the, not far from Hugh Hefner's house in, in sort of West, West Hollywood, going near, not, not too far from UCLA in LA, very fancy part of, of the city to live. Um, and it was in a state of disrepair. They were renting this house, I guess, but there was like still Christmas decorations up and it was like March or April. It was, a, it was kind of like, well, this is not cared for, though it wasn't manicured like you would expect the Jackson, mm -hmm. you know, from what you'd sort of seen and knew about this guy. And then there was this, there was this toy boat in the, in the swimming pool and it was just, banging against the, uh, the tiles in the pool repeatedly. And it, it, it occurred to me that it was like this, it seemed like this a Peter Pan dream gone wrong to me, mm. you know, because it was like all this wealth, but then in that Sunset Boulevard kind of way where it was just had this coat of dust on it, right? I was like, this is so trippy. Is this, what is this, you know, what does any, what this is, what does this mean? <laughs> I'm like looking for the meaning in all this because I was so fascinated by Michael Jackson. So, Go down there and um, I do my my ten minute performance for you know Michael and blanket and there's helicopters flying over distract which they have to like cover themselves every couple of minutes because they were so used to like this is like something was going on at the Jackson house and the paparazzi was like on it wow but, well only by overhead like they couldn't they couldn't get in the, on the property but they could fly overhead yeah. so, so uh, I do my bit and I ended up doing this, this interpretive dance for, for Michael and they, they were giggling and they thought it was really funny. And they, just 10 minutes is all you did. 10 minutes. Yeah. 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 10 minutes. And I, which ended up in this sort of dance routine, which I performed with the diminishing cards. Um, and they mm -hmm. were, they were um, amused uh, by my, you know, stylings because while Michael is such an incredible gifted dancer, right. I, I, in my act, I, I, I intentionally try not to hit the one where, you know, 
no, I know where it's at, you know, I know where I, I can count and I've got a good sense of rhythm, but it, you know, it's kind of like going, dancing in and out of that space. And I, they, they thought that was funny. I think they thought it was amusing. And it was very fun to dance for Michael Jackson. I got to say, it was it was cool. <laughs> that was pretty trippy itself. <laughs> it was trippy, and the and the music that I danced to was a uh, Thelonious Monk's uh, Dina and, and Thelonious Monk's music is intentionally off. It's not. It doesn't. It it falls. Sometimes it's behind. Sometimes it's it it, it pushes. And it, but it all it feels a little a little loopy, a little drunk, if you will. You know, kind of like it's got its own sort of take. And dancing to that really will take you out of it. So so. At the end of it, I was able to like fulfill this weird, you know, dream that I would get to see this guy in person and see what his world looked like. And unfortunately, it, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was a weird picture. You know, it wasn't. It was a, something I couldn't have imagined. And so that was your one and only in and out experience, basically, in brush with uh, Michael Jackson. Because I know he had talked with so many other magicians, Franz Ferrari and others. Yeah, like I, yeah, right. That was that was my only experience. And then he, mm -hmm. he ended up sadly he he passed uh, uh, you know a few months after after that, and left those poor kids behind. It's just horrible to think that you know. Sure. Guys. Are yeah, on a completely sure, yeah, different note, when you mentioned Thelonious Monk, that's it's, it's funny. That's the second time that name has been invoked within the last week. I was at John Gon's house just earlier this week, and we were listening to some jazz. And I was we were talking about Dave Brubeck, and and um, I, I mentioned um, Lionel Hampton, and also uh, um, I said, you know, I'd love to have seen Thelonious Monk live. We were talking about that, and and so then you mentioned Thelonious Monk but again. It's like wow, <laughs> that's kind yeah. of surreal. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's not yeah. a name that normally people throw out, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe not. I and mean, what a unique character. And, and yeah, I mean, and for anybody interested in Thelonious Monk, I think there's a documentary, which I haven't seen in 20, 30 years. I think it's called Straight No Chaser is the name. Uh, and it's a really great look at what a, what a absolute genius. Uh, he was. was. Man. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, there were so many people who were great. I mean, I love jazz, you know, Stan Getz and so many others oh, yeah, that were sure. Cannibal Adderley and, and whatnot. Sure. I, mean, I was yeah. big time into that, all that and, and M, um, but uh, loved, loved that. It, it made me think also when you mentioned Hugh Hefner, because they would have uh, Hugh Hefner's jazz and pop poll. I'm sorry, Hugh Hefner, Playboy's jazz and pop poll that was in the magazine each year. People would vote on what albums, you know, uh, with uh, uh, for the for the best uh, of the year and, and all that. But um, uh, so did you ever perform uh, at Hef's house? In no, his mansion? no, okay. I never I'd never been to, uh, to to the Playboy Mansion. Hey, talk with uh, Michael Weber. He said he had performed for him once. And I thought that must have been an experience. I mean, we didn't get into any detail. It's just kind of like mm -hmm. in passing as we were talking and it just kind of kind of name dropped as, you know, and I thought, wow, that had to be something. Wow. Well, something for Hef because Weber is so, such an incredible well, uh, artist yeah. in his own right. And I think he, I'd love watching him perform. I think he's so engaging and cool. And I bet I'm all, I can only imagine that Hef was like, mm -hmm. you know, you know, yeah. Right. Well, listen, this has been a lot of fun and it's great to uh, hear the stories and stuff in the, the background and whatnot. So thanks Rob very much for being on here this week. It was really fun, Scott. Thank you. Um, you know, it's good to be here. And I uh, enjoyed I enjoyed our chat. Well, the name of my podcast is called The Magic Word Podcast. And so I always end by asking my guests, what is your philosophy of life? What's your word or words? I don't mean like abracadabra. I mean, like, what is it that motivates you and moves you each day and wants you, motivates you to get up and move? Well, I would, I'm, I, I don't have uh, I don't have a secret ingredients that's boiled down to to, to a few words or a mantra. Um, I'm not a I, I can't pick between the Beatles or the Stones or tell yep. you if it's it's oranges or apples because every day my philosophy changes. But the the one consistent thing that I've found is that uh, I do things because they come from my heart and I follow my dreams and I don't quit and um, I I follow my own. You know, I follow my own light and I try to make work that's provocative and interesting. And if people like it, that's great. And if they don't, that's fine too. And um, you get one life. So as far as I know, uh, so I think you should try to do as much cool stuff as possible. That's great. Yep. And following your dream. <laughs> because you only live once. Great. Rob, thanks very much. It's been wonderful. It really has. Thanks, Scott. So with the Magic Word Podcast, that was Rob Zabrecki. This is Scotty out.
Thank you, Rob, very much for being my guest this week on the Magic Word Podcast. I appreciate your friendship and your words. It was great, and I think a lot of people had some information that they learned here, particularly about the history of the seances at the uh, Magic Castle. Uh, just to correct a couple of things, by the way, those of you who are listening, uh, is he mentioned Francis Carlyle as being the first. Actually, it was E. Raymond Carlyle. It was just a misstep that he had uh, made. And there were a couple of others who were in there then, too. Max Maven had had done some, as well, uh, of course, as Ed Fowler, who, as I understand, did uh, at some point almost 800 uh, of the seances. And the name of the person he was trying to think of was Mark Edward. Uh, that was the last name of the person before Leo Koska and then and then him. So, again, there have been just a, a handful of people who have done the seances at the Magic Castle, and those are the names of uh, the ones I'm aware of uh, that were there, to kind of correct that a little bit then as well. Listen, we've been having a lot of fun with this particular episode 666. I wanted to kind of do a little bit of a... Uh, a of a video, or I should say an audio parody, if you will, uh, of this whole thing. Uh, since uh, Genie Magazine had done that with episode 666, or I should say publication or uh, number 666, and with uh, uh, Max Maven as the uh, person who was uh, featured in that uh, particular uh, magazine. And so I uh, had Max earlier, uh, number 600. I didn't reserve him for this one. Wasn't sure who I was going to uh, get, but I thought that Rob Zabarecki would be just perfect for it, and I believe he was. It was a lot of fun. Uh, nothing at all <laughs> satanic or anything about this, although you might notice some of the books I've got over here in the back. It's kind of interesting. I got these actually for a trick that... Um, uh, my friend Brad Henderson had, and I'm going to describe this. It's from his Satanic Book Test, and it's uh, kind of fun and interesting. I want to uh, read this to you here for just a second. It says, the uh, uh, books, they hold the power to build the strongest of civilizations and destroy even the most powerful men. Throughout the history of recorded tests, three books have garnered the reputation of being the most wicked, the most deviant, the most evil. The first which is this one right here, the Necro Necromonicon, is, uh, what do you say? The Necromonicon, published in 1634 by the mad monk Alhazred. Uh, uh, to read it in its entirety is said to cause madness. It is a book for the conjuration of demons, currently available in paperback for your exorcistic convenience. The second book is the Satanic Bible, which is this one right here, uh, the, the, satanic, <laughs> the Satanic Bible. And the Satanic Bible was released in the 1970s, and its publication was heralded with riots in the city streets. To read it, it is said to turn chaste women easy. Excellent bedtime material. And finally, and perhaps the most dangerous of all, Good Things by Martha Stewart. <laughs> and with these tools, you and I are going to take a journey into the world of evil. So that is from the beginning script from Brad Henderson's Satanic Book Test. Kind of, uh, kind of weird, and I thought appropriate for <laughs> this episode number 666 that we're doing over here. Well, I want to mention a few other things that are of importance, and that is we're going to be having a contest. And the contest is something that is open to everyone uh, in the world because we're going to be having this. Uh, uh, it's a, an opportunity for you to win a uh, copy, an ebook of uh, Eli Mark's new self-working trick. Uh, it's a book that's a collection of a dozen of Eli Mark's short stories, 10 of which have never been published before. And the winners can pick uh, whatever ebook format that you want, whether it's going to be a Kindle, a, a Nook, a Kobo, Apple, or a Google Play. Now, those of you who may not be familiar with Eli Marks, if you go back and just do a little bit of a search in the podcast, you will hear me chatting with uh, John Gaspard, who is the author of this, this series, and I have been with him since the beginning, and he has been uh, with me then also, uh, not only as a patron, someone who, is, uh, someone who is a friend of the Magic Word, who pledges his financial support, but also 
has his own podcast, which I would recommend you listen to because it gives you an opportunity actually to hear some uh, short conversations with some of the people that I've had on my podcast and others that I haven't, uh, plus also being able to hear uh, the book it read in its entirety. I say the book. He started off with the ambitious card, and he's just kind of going from there. So he has different uh, uh, books All the from his series that will eventually be out on Audible, but I, I would suggest that you might want to read these uh, first. They're just excellent books and a lot of fun. It's the Eli Marks series available again digitally or in hard copy uh, through Amazon and uh, through any way pretty much you would normally get your your books. So I uh, am going to have a place on the website for if you go to the magicwordpodcast.com and there you'll find uh, a link where that you can or a form you fill out basically and with that form you will then enter into a contest and then I will randomly select three names and I'm going to uh, let this contest run for a couple weeks, which means that uh, I will uh, choose a name sometime uh, on or around March the 9th. So on March the 10th, we will be announcing whoever the three winners are. And because, again, it's an ebook, this is available to the world because it can be sent uh, in an ebook format, PDF, or however, as I mentioned, uh, Kindle, Nook, uh, Kobo, Apple, or Google Play, that you can receive this. So unlike a physical book that had to be mailed and it would have some foreign postage associated with it, you get the idea. So, again, uh, giving away three copies copies of the Eli Mark book, uh, it's the self-working trick. And I have uh, read this and uh, the books, uh, they are the short stories all within uh, one, one book. And so uh, thank you very much, John Gaspard, for offering this great opportunity for the viewers to uh, listen to or get to read uh, this, this book then too. And uh, while we're on that subject then as well, I also want to welcome and thank some other people who have become friends of the Magic Word specifically. We just had Chris Morrison recently join. He has uh, uh, given a uh, PayPal donation. Thank you very much, Chris, and welcome to the Friends of the Magic Word. Also, Mark Byrne had made a financial pledge, so this way that he is through Patreon uh, pledging each month, and he's gotten some pretty cool perks that come along with that, with some e-books and video uh, lectures and things like that. Uh, as well as a couple of other people, Joyce Benjamin and Jesse Robinson, both who have given annual pledges. And that's another thing that you could do through Patreon, which if you don't want to pledge on a monthly basis, you can make a one-time pledge each year. And with that, you get a 10% discount on that annual pledge and still get all of the really cool perks at whatever level you decide to to pledge. So that's just another little advantage that you get there as well. So I recommend if you have an opportunity, please go over to patreon.com uh, and you will then uh, find out more information on how that you can support us at different levels and get some pretty cool perks along the way too. Well, this has been, uh, again, a lovely podcast and just uh, kind of a little bit more of a macabre kind of a thing. And it was our episode 666. And it is uh, an unusual mark to have. So we will move on forward from here. Thank you very much for letting us have this little tongue-in-cheek kind of episode uh, that we've played with. I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, continue to follow us. And for that matter, I will hopefully see you then next week. And until then, stay well, get booked, and remember to follow your dreams and do things because they come from your heart. This is Scotty out. Let's <laughs> go.